why do we need privacy preserving AI? Well, the biggest issue is data, right? Um, so everyone's been talking about how do we access healthcare data, how do we access government data, and how do we use it without actually revealing the underlying data behind, say, a patient's uh, conditions or you know the spending behind uh, an individual. So there are actually really interesting techniques that scientists and researchers have been working on. The first one, and I apologize, I didn't realize the screen would be that small, so you can't really read it. Uh, the first one is data anonymization, and it may seem simple to just get the data set, remove the names, maybe add some random data here and there, and that could be your solution. But I'm here to tell you a story. So in 2006, Netflix actually released a huge data set on movie ratings. They had 100 million records, and they had about 17,000 movies, 400 and 480k users, and uh, essentially what they did was they removed the, removed the names from all the data sets and added some random data here and there. But in 2008, two computer scientists were able to launch something called a linkage attack. And a linkage attack is simply just getting another data set, say for example IMDB, which is an open movie rating website, and connecting it to the data set from Netflix and identifying people who made those uh, movie ratings. Now, I know Movie ratings aren't that important, you probably don't care what you rated, I don't know, Slumdog Millionaire, whatever movies you watch, right? But this is actually really important because if you launch patient data, which actually happened in the mid-1990s, you can do these linkage attacks and find out patient data of specific people. So, what are the solutions that people are working on? And in fact, what are we working on at Perlin? So this is just three different solutions. There are many more solutions out there, but I'll sort of go over the basic aspects of what they are. So homomorphic encryption, um, I'll sort of give you an analogy to explain it. If it was a black box completely isolated, you have a lock for that box and a key. I put in a piece of clay into that box, I then lock the key, I lock the lock and take the key away. I then give someone access to the box through a special set of gloves that they can put their hands in and mold the clay or do some work to the clay. But they can't actually take the clay outside. So that's essentially what homomorphic encryption is. Being able to do work on encrypted data without actually having access to underlying data. But I, as the user, can come up to the box, unlock the box whenever I want, take out the claim. Okay? However, to do this in computer science is actually very expensive. So it's about 10,000 or 1,000 times the cost of a usual computation. So this one we're working on, and we're actually doing research ourselves, and I know people in India are doing a lot of research. Uh, but at this stage, it's not exactly feasible to do a computation at a thousand times the cost. The second one is kind of interesting. Uh, it's around differential privacy, which is more of a statistical model. Uh, the way you can think about this is every time you take in a data set, for example, if you're voting on yes or no, you take in that data set and there's a probability that it won't take that data set and just put a random number instead. What that means is, unlike before where you were anonymizing the data, Every single data point you're collecting now has a probability of being wrong, which means you can't actually do a linkage attack, uh, which is quite interesting because this is one of the ways that you can do it without having any computational overhead or very low computational overhead and statistically significant results. So this is something that we're building out, a differential privacy engine, um, and there's a lot of research being done on this area as well. The final one is secure multi-party computation. Uh, this one is more about trusted nodes, so I won't go into too much detail, but essentially it's trusted nodes taking in private inputs and then coming out with some computation. The implications of this is quite limited at this stage, and there are a few companies working on this, but at this stage the first two are a bit more promising than the last one. The other big issue that I see sort of coming up, and there have been people talking about supercomputers for AI, is the fact that AI takes a lot of computation. In fact, the rate of increase of computation is 300,000. This is a stat from uh, the CTO of OpenAI. However, if you look at Moore's Law, which is, you know, we double compute every 18 months, there's going to be a point at which we sort of eclipse that number. And it might not be tomorrow, might not be next year, it could be in 10 years. But nonetheless, we need to start thinking about computing resources. And another interesting stat is that we only actually use 9%. We have a 9% utilization of our laptops and computers on average, and about 21% utilization of our mobile phones. And the servers that we use at AWS, etc., only 30%. So as a society, we're in 
quite wasteful of our computing resources, which is not an issue that people really talk about. So, introducing Berlin. So Berlin is a decentralized cloud computing company. We're essentially an Airbnb for cloud computing. Uh, we connect mobile and laptop resources to people that might need it. For example, a lot of people in this room, AI scientists and machine learning people. So uh, the way we do that is that we have our own virtual machine, which is based on WebAssembly, which you install on your mobile phone or laptop or any sort of device that you can think of. And then we have this software development kit, which has privacy tools and anything you really think of to build our models that will run on this. And the benefit to machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, individuals is that we're actually much cheaper than our alternatives as well. So a bit about our company. We have about 100 uh, venture capitals and funds invested in our company right now. We have offices in Singapore, New York, and Hong Kong, and soon hopefully India. So this is one of the expansion markets for us, and we're very happy to be invited here to talk to you all uh, as our partnership with Media.io. And as you can see, partnership with Media.io, uh, Telecom Indonesia, and some other amazing people that have helped us on this global journey. Uh, two of the big uh, focus areas for us is actually India and Indonesia. And I think, uh, here, did you want to come up on stage to announce the, the big announcement, I guess? Yeah? So, I mean, yeah, first of all, thank you very much to uh, everyone for inviting us down here. Uh, what we really wanted to announce to everyone today, and my slides still working at the perfect time, but, <laughs> can we get my slides up? Okay, I'll just talk about it, and you can pretend that this visual is there. There, there you go, okay, kind of ruined it. But, <laughs> we are announcing a global hackathon with India uh, and India Oak. So this is the AI for all global hackathon. We have judges from all over the world, Sequoia, IBM, Telecom Indonesia helping out. And what, we do, what we're doing is inviting you all to submit machine learning and AI models to solve social impact issues in India and Indonesia and also across the globe. So, yeah. <laughs> So all you have to do, we are actually launching it today, so you just have to go to berlin.net slash hackathon and you can submit your ideas for stage one. You don't need to do any coding or anything like that, it's just simply submitting an idea. Stage two is where you get your hands on our decentralized cloud platform, where we'll give you some free credits to build out your models and come up with some cool ideas around privacy preserving AI and social impact. Yeah. Thank you. you want to add So yeah, I'll hand over to you to talk about India and privacy preserving AI and also, yeah, what we're doing here. Thanks, Ajay, for uh, launching the hackathon. So, uh, just to give an introduction. So, the one consistent theme that has, uh, you know, uh, that we've seen in this conference has been, you know, this debate or rather this conflict between, uh, you know, privacy of individual data and, you know, common good for the society. And at Niti I.O., I think it's very important for us to share our perspective on this, on privacy-preserving AI, on you know going beyond just the legal and regulatory frameworks, how it aligns with our national strategy, and what we propose to do next. So just a quick, uh, yeah, so just a quick background establishing the case for privacy preserving AI. So this is something that you know we all know that the issues on privacy and security of data are centered on you know data collection without consent, privacy of personal data, unethical use of data, companies uh, acquiring large data sets and gaining an unfair uh, advantage, which leads us to our Debate on. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm so bad at this. <laughs> Which leads us to a debate on, you know, utility of of rich data and artificial intelligence versus concerns on privacy and uh, ethical use of data. So, you know, on one hand, uh, you know, we have this, uh, you know, as individuals, we own and generate data that could, you know, potentially transform healthcare, education, distribute resources more efficiently. 
and uh, you know on and you know for I'll give you an example you know for example we uh, you know data on let's say our diet our sleeping pattern our uh, you know uh, geolocation data could you know inform us could help us build AI models that inform users about their habits you know about you know how to improve their uh, you know their diet their diet and uh, you know give other kind of patterns and uh, you know give them predictions and give them more meaningful insights so ai models require rich and granular in quality data to you know give meaningful insights to the users but on the other hand there is a discussion on you know how you know organizations are uh, you know misusing this data to gain an unethical advantage you know how they could be discriminating how they could be profiling so you know where what what is what is next you know how do we find that middle ground between you know uh, these two debates so as to deliver the benefits of ai to users and also protect their privacy so uh, you know one potential solution could be you know looking beyond the whole you know legal and regulatory frameworks which are also very important how can technology help us address this problem so which brings us to privacy preserving ai so i'll just uh, you know ajay has very well uh, you know given a primer a brief primer on the different techniques but i'll just you know give our uh, sort of just a very simple illustrative two illustrative models on two approaches for privacy preserving ai so one is you know uh, for a single user let's say you know this is on separating data and computer so you know you have a you have a person you have an individual let's say a and you know she wants to perform computation uh, addition between two numbers so instead of sharing the raw data with the uh, the, the server or the device that we perform the computation she only sends the encrypted data so the homomorphic encryption it's called homomorphic encryption and you know it encrypts the data and you know the, the server or the system only performs the com computation on the encrypted data it then sends back the system decrypts the data and it sends the result to the user the user receives the result so this way no data no raw data was shared between the user and the you know and the server so on, on another approach could be you know and this is called uh, multi party computation this could be used for multiple users is that you know you have a uh, central server which has a, let's say an untrained model and that is sent to you know more, more than one uh, you know individual or three in this case you know three three nodes uh, three uh, users who perform who have the data on the local devices and who also use that device to perform computation on that data and then send back only the change calls in the model to the central uh, or to the central uh, to the central server which then updates its ai model so you know this also has the twin benefit of utilizing uh, computing more efficiently now the more, you know the core of this discussion why is preserving uh, privacy preserving ai important for our national strategy so uh, you know the success of digital infrastructure projects like upi and uh, india start have really ushered india into an age of innovation uh, as an illustration you know i'll talk about the recently proposed national health stack uh, which is an integrated uh, digital healthcare system and aims to create a uh, you know master health data for the nation which is you know integrating all health records across center and states so uh, a technology like this could be very very crucial you know uh, when ayushman bharat skills so the two components key components of uh, this uh, proposed health stack is a uh, you know federated postal health report and privacy by design and it's very encouraging to see that there is a shift from centralized to a federated approach which uh, so in, in that approach uh, i'll just briefly explain what it is so individuals users have access to their postal health reports and they will be the ones who will be deciding you know who to give access to what uh, you know uh, like what to consent to and through an uh, you know intermediary body called a trustee so in that case in, in a solution in a framework like this we believe that you know we feel that privacy preserving ai could be a very good fit and could potentially you know unlock the value of these electronic health records which stored you know we have the entire medical history you know billing information radiology test results and you know it could really help deliver personalized healthcare to individuals so why uh, you know this this uh, this area is very still nascent and uh, you know the research in this area is gaining momentum solutions of scale are yet to be seen in india and if going forward if we can prove the scalability uh, you know uh, 
it would be of value for us to embed this in our national infrastructure. So the way forward for us would be, you know, uh, we collaborating on pilot projects, uh, you know, for example, use cases, applications in healthcare and financial inclusion to study the scalability of these techniques, uh, investing in areas of research like differential pri uh, privacy, privacy by design, safety critical AI, multi-party computations. We could introduce these as, uh, you know, I mean, uh, as research topics or uh, areas to study in, you know, the cores and ties that we propose in our national strategy. And you know, uh, in the future, when the data, national data marketplace, uh, you know, is, I mean, it, it, you know, we have a, you know, we have a framework. For, we already have a framework for that. But once it becomes complete, we can integrate this with privacy-preserving AI techniques. We're also, we also just today launched a hackathon, which Ajay introduced, AI for All Hackathon, which is a first of its kind hackathon on uh, privacy-preserving AI and uh, distributed computing. And uh, it'll be, it's, it's already live. And uh, you know, it's a two-stage uh, it's a two-stage hackathon. In the first uh, stage, we are just inviting proposals on AI, uh, you know, AI proposals on use cases in the social sector, in healthcare, uh, education, uh, urbanization, mobility, uh, agriculture. And in the second case, uh, in the second stage, we'll be you know, uh, uh, you know, evaluating the solutions on the, you know on their uh, whether how well do they you know utilize. Uh, distributed computing, do they have an element of distributed computing, how well do they understand the privacy preserving AI and then of course they'll be mentored and they can, they'll have access to the, uh, to the libraries, uh, I believe. And uh, yeah, so I think, you know, this hackathon would be a very good medium for us to look at solutions and see if we could potentially scale them.